Imagine learning in a small group intimate setting while exploring unique European locations. EU Vet CE Experiences offers race-approved CE seminars that combine half-day lectures with time to relax and discover captivating cultures. The CE sessions are delivered in English, allowing you to elevate your career while vacationing with loved ones. Experience the perfect blend of learning and luxury at EU Vet CE Experiences interactive seminars in hand-picked European destinations. Elevate your knowledge and recharge simultaneously. Visit euveterinaryce.com to learn more. It's my job, right? I have chosen this career path that I know I'm going to see some of the most horrible stuff that most people do not want to see, most people should not see. Welcome to Vet Life Reimagined. What if there were a veterinary CSI? There is in real life. And Dr. Adam Stern is one of the stars. Dr. Stern took his initial dream of working in counterterrorism into veterinary forensic pathology. You may not have known that this path existed, but that's why we have this podcast. There was even recently the inaugural Animal Forensic Investigation Conference as well. Dr. Adam Stern says he never has two days that are exactly alike, but he is currently the Associate Professor of Forensic Pathology at the University of Florida and also does consultations. I certainly didn't have this as an elective op option when I was in vet school, but Dr. Stern talks about what the students get to learn, which is applicable in a lot of settings, and his career is so fascinating. I'm so excited to share this episode with you, so let's get to the conversation with Dr. Adam Stern. All right, welcome, Dr. Stern. I'm very excited to welcome you on Vet Life Reimagined. And I love the beginning of your veterinary career story because you did not come out of the womb knowing you wanted to be in veterinary medicine <laughs> like some people. So share a little bit about your first career wishes and goals. Yeah, my career start was a little different. You know, I didn't grow up saying I want to be a veterinarian. I, I really didn't know much about veterinary medicine except for the fact that there were dog and cat doctors and I took my rabbit to a veterinarian once. And that was like my only experience. So I actually wanted to go into counterterrorism, looking at ways to pr protect industries from sabotage and things of that nature. But my course changed when I was in college. I got some advice that I would say was not the best and basically said that counterterrorism and those things were not important. Fast forward to today, it's obviously very important. But I already decided through college, I was like, I'll be a veterinarian. It sounds like an interesting and potentially productive career. But I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. And then here I am today, made a lot of choices throughout my career, kind of guided me to, to where I am now with forensic pathology and forensic medicine. Yeah, I kind of see it coming full circle a little bit. <laughs> So you actually went to the University of Prince Edward Island for your veterinary school, and it's not a university that I'm very familiar with. So why did you decide on that school, and what was your veterinary school experience like? Yeah, so when I applied to veterinary school, I kind of had the, the internal rule for myself that I'm applying one time, and that's it. So pretty much all the schools in, in North America, you know, with a few that I didn't have the prereq for, I wasn't going to, you know, take a prereq for just one school. So I pretty much cast a wide net and University of Prince Edward Island up there in Northern Eastern Canada with the, the place that I chose. It's a small little island. There's a nine mile bridge that you have to go across to get onto the island. There's also a ferry. It was a great school, AVMA accredited. So there was no issues with becoming licensed in the United States. And, and actually one third of my class was from the United States. So we had 60 students. So it was a really small class. 20 of us were from the, the U.S. It was a good time. It's where the ocean freezes for those who don't know how cold it, it can get. And I had up to nine to 10 feet of snow in my backyard in the winter. So, yeah. A little bit different than living in Florida where you are now. So. Oh, yeah. That snow wouldn't last a second down here, but I got my fix uh, up there for sure. Yeah. 60 people in your class. That can be really nice having a, a smaller class sizes. We're going the other direction now. It's, you know, we seem to be growing our class sizes. But 
how did you enjoy vet school? Was it challenging for you? Were there good parts, bad parts? I mean, overall, it was great. We all have our good memories and then we have our bad memories of, you know, the different tests that you had to take or there was that just that, that one class or like, I really don't like the class at all, but you have to take it, right? We have to be well-rounded so we can pass our NAVLI and be good steward for the profession. It was great because I did uh, a lot of large animal work for my clinical uh, year. And that was a lot of fun because uh, I actually didn't have a lot of uh, other students on the rotations. It was usually like two or three. So with the large animal caseload in the hospital, you got to do a lot more than, say, if you were on the small animal side. And so lots of good things happened out there. And that's where I figured out that I wanted to do pathology. So, I mean, I have to say that I, I experienced a lot and went in a direction that I needed to go. Yeah. You know, there was one girl in my class going through vet school who, from the beginning, knew she wanted to go into pathology. And you don't see very many of the people, but there's <laughs> one girl in particular. And, and so what was it about pathology that really was attractive? Well, I went into vet school. Really, I didn't want to do pathology. I didn't know what a pathologist really was. Uh, you know, like when I worked in a, a vet clinic, you, you sent this biopsy, you put it in a mystery box, and voila, you had a report a couple of days later. But really didn't have an understanding of what happened between the collection to the report. So in vet school, I realized that I did not want to be what I would say is in the front of the house. So the working on the live animal, I wanted to do something diagnostic related that was kind of in the background. So whether it was radiology, diagnostic imaging, or clinical pathology or anatomic pathology. Kind of that was my first direction and the fork in the road is like live animal or bits and pieces of an animal. And I went for bits and pieces. I went down that diagnostic route. And then once I took the path classes, it was really, do I want to do anatomic path or radiology? And then really kind of going through the, the clinics, I was like, I don't want to be a radiologist. I didn't like the whole uh, sitting in a dark room all the time. Uh, nowadays, now you have teleradiology, it's very different. But back then, a lot of it was on film and, you know, putting it on the light boxes and all that. So it wasn't really my thing. And so that's how I figured out pathology was the area for me. There was lots of questions you can answer. There was this mystery about, you know, what happened to the animal. And I think that might have been my underlying thing the whole time was the, the mystery part. But it Probably didn't realize it at the time. Yeah, the forensic part. <laughs> There's yeah. a puzzle that you're trying to put together. So with pathology, I'll admit, I only know so much. Can you specialize in certain animals or did you get to kind of do any and all types of species when it came to pathology? Yeah, so when it, when it comes to pathology, when you do your residency training, again, you're being trained to be a day one pathologist. So just like in vet school, you're being trained to be a day one veterinarian. So kind of can treat everything. Uh, that's kind of how pathology goes. We learn about domestic animals. We also learn about wildlife, zoological animals. And our certification exam does cover all that. So, you know, I had to learn about mice and rats and gerbils. I had to learn about lions and tigers and bears and all the cats, dogs, horses, and cattle. So we really have to train the all-around pathologists. So yes, you can really work on anything. Now, different programs have emphasis on certain things. Some have more of a comparative approach. Some are, you know, the more traditional cat, dog, or cattle. Some have a lot of poultry, you know, so it kind of depends where you're at. And then there are programs where you can sort of specialize, where you do maybe two years of more companion animal work, and then you move on to zoological specimens. So there are a couple of programs that are, are a bit more specific in that. But overall, a general pathologist, but then, you know, other places will have dermatopathologists, like, you know, they, all they do is, is skin. So you get that really great training in skin pathology or hepatopathology. So looking at the liver. So you, you kind of have the skill sets of the different pathologists there. Yeah, we've actually had someone on who is a more derm-specific pathologist. So yeah, exactly. And, and so what was most interesting to you? Did you like the diversity or did you kind of find you liked a particular area? 
for me, I, I want to be a generalist. Like that was my, my first thing. Cause I wanted to work in a diagnostic lab. So a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And then during my training, you know, I only had a, a handful of what I would call like cases of legal importance. And honestly, I didn't feel that we helped. I think in some ways he almost muddied the waters by listing off all of these differentials for emaciation. And you're looking at a starvation case, but you're like, well, it could be cancer. It could be cardiac disease. But we were looking at the animal and you didn't have those things. So for me, that was an area that, you know, opened my eyes. And I felt that, you know, this is actually very interesting. And it was very unique and it still is. And there was a lot of area of growth. And so I think with all of that, I gravitated towards the forensic pathology side. You know, I did a lot of continuing education to learn about all the different facets, mostly on, on the human side, because there wasn't much on the veterinary side. And through all of that, I realized this is really what is probably going to make me want to go to work every day. And not so much just looking at, you know, canine parvovirus and lymphoma and in cat and things of that nature. Yeah. Not only are you solving a mystery, but now it's it's like a, a bigger purpose, right? You're trying to more like a murder mystery. <laughs> yeah. And like I can see the end goal. Like I can see the big picture where for me, diagnosing a disease in this one animal, it, it answers a question. It helped people, you know, don't get me wrong, but it just wasn't my drive. For me, I, I want to advocate for the animal. At the same time, I also, the work that I do, my, my duty is really to the court, and not so much to the defense or the prosecution or the dog owner, the cat owner, horse owner, whoever it is, it, to the judge and the jury. And so I give them my information. I tell them what I see, and then they make their decision based on all the facts of the case. And so I advocate for the animal. I help the court do their job, and, and I get great satisfaction at that. We would like to thank our sponsor, Vet Badger, the all-in-one practice management software that puts relationships first. Created by working veterinary parents, Vet Badger provides all the communication, team workflow, and medical management tools you need to run an efficient practice and get home to the relationships that matter most. In support of parents in Vet Med, Vet Badger will be offering a signed copy of the book, Pregnancy and Postpartum Considerations for the Veterinary Team by Emily Singler to everyone who registers for a demo between Mother's Day, May 12th, and Father's Day, June 16th. To register, visit vetbadger.com and find the link in the description below. I, I want to come back to the legal aspect of it, but while we're, we're kind of on this part, was there a particular case that still sticks in your mind that kind of helped you solidify, yeah, like this is, this is it for me? Yeah, it was towards the end of my, my residency and we had multiple canids so not dogs just canids because we didn't know what kind of animal they were and they were all nicely positioned along a riverbank and all their forelegs were partially cut off and placed in a nice pile so like looking at now i can tell you those are coyotes and that's just what happens because they were all had their pelts removed and everything but the concern was that these were just domestic dogs and so documenting what happened to them, documenting how they died, and then determining who they were, you know, what animal species, that was really the culmination of the whole thing because people were up in arms and people were killing dogs and, and doing all this to them when in reality, this, although probably not the best way to dispose of carcasses, it was somewhat of a, a, a legal practice because it was for hunting and everything else, but maybe not so much on how they dispose of the carcasses and leaving them nice placed on a riverbank where people walk, but probably not the best choice and probably a violation of some ordinance in that area. But that was the culmination for me to show how the work that you do as a pathologist can really answer a question. And that's a very simple case. You know, it's not one of these heinous crimes where you have multiple moving parts, you have human victims, animal victims, and and all of those other things. But this was like the case during my residency that 
showed me that, look, we can actually help and we can actually answer questions and scientifically doing so. Yeah, I can definitely see how media would pick up that opportunity to talk about, you know, someone oh, yeah. doing cruelty and, and yeah, you can kind of help that. And, and going back to that legal system, because that, I mean, you are very closely tied with courts and, and being a witness and things like that. But I also think about veterinary medicine. We tend to be very nervous around legal issues. So <laughs> I'm curious, do you ever get scared by a lawyer or, you know, like how, how does the system, do they seem to respect you being the expert witness? What is that kind of dynamic? Yeah. So, I mean, you're working for the courts, right? You're telling them, here's my facts. Here's my opinions. This is how I came to my decision and judge and jury take my work and do what you want with it. When it comes to being questioned by the attorneys, because that's how your information is going to get to the judge and the jury. Like you have a report, but you have to defend your report and testify to the fact, testify to the photograph, to things of that nature. You got to remember that the attorneys, whether they're prosecutors or defense, and they have called you as their witness or they are cross-examining you, they're doing their job, right? They want the best for their client. The prosecutor is the state, the defense attorney is the defendant. And so they're going to, they're going to try to poke holes in your case. They're going to try to point out things that maybe you did or didn't do. You know, I've had cases where they question me why I didn't do something. And I just want to say, because that test does not exist, you know, but you can't just come out and say that because the question isn't asked in such a way. It's not like, why didn't you do this, Dr. Stern? If you didn't do this, correct? And you're like, yeah, you can't say more because it's, it's a, a yes or no type question. So then the other side has to ask you, well, why didn't you do it? Or why didn't you resort to looking in that textbook? Oh, because that textbook has never been written. There is no textbook authority on such and such. So they are going to be doing the best for their client. They're sometimes really loud, really obnoxious, and you really just can't take it personally. Like you, you may be attacked for something in your background. I had a case recently where they were attacking me for everything I've ever done because they wanted me to be only a cat doctor and they didn't want me to testify on the different animal species. So they basically made it look like the only thing I ever did in my entire life from publications to research to teaching were on cats. And so the other attorney had to basically then go and do a rebuttal on just my cat work and show that I did work on lots of other species, including the species of, of interest for that case. And in the end, the judge decided whether or not my testimony should be limited. And he's like, no, he's not actually just a cat doctor. And it seems that Dr. Stern has written the book on many different things and can absolutely testify on the facts of this case for that species. So you kind of have to just go with it. It's just everybody trying to do their job to the best of their ability. And you as the expert, regardless of, I would say, what side I have been called to testify for, my answer is going to be the same for both sides. My opinion is not going to change if a prosecutor asks me the question or a defense attorney. It's going to be my opinion. And that's that. And they'll use that however they want. Yeah. Just kind of have to rely on them to go back and forth with each other. Yeah, and sometimes that's what happens is, you know, you get, you know, your direct exam, then you cross exam, then they redirect you, then they recross you, and it goes back and forth. Uh, and then there's other times where they just basically go with, yep, what Dr. Stern says, you know, that's fine and dandy, but we're going to, we have questions on other parts of the case. And so the pathology is the pathology, and no one's going to refute the fact that the dog was shot or the, the cow was shot it's going to be other facts of the case than my question. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. And so, you know, we're talking about this and in your more day-to-day kind of setting, you're in a university setting. So how does working in a university also come into the forensic aspect of things? Well, I think in the university, besides just doing the, the casework, 
we have access to a lot of different research capabilities. And so there's a lot of areas within veterinary forensic science, or I even call it animal forensic science because it's not just a veterinarian. There's lots of analysts who are involved who are not vets. So there's, there's lots of areas of research and some of them are quite basic, but commonly used things that just have not yet been validated or, you know, we're doing some work with artificial intelligence to see if they can predict things based on how reports are written. Simple questions like possible for cruelty or not, or possible for neglect or not. We're doing some social science work, looking at risk factors of animal abuse, because we, we've always said less than two years old, pit bulls, intact male dog. We've recently did some work that we're finding some different risk factors and, and not the same that people have talked about in the past or, or how are the animal victims associated with their, the ascender? Uh, what's their relationship? Is it, is it a family member? Is it a roommate that lives with the owner? Is it a complete stranger or a neighbor? And so we're starting to look at those things to look for different demographic with the relationships between these animals, especially in cases where the suspect not, m- might not be known right away and, and, and start to say, this is what happens to the animal. What kind of relationship have we seen with cases in the past? That's fascinating. I didn't even yeah. think about bringing AI. AI can get into anything. <laughs> but oh, it sure can. can. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. And then talking about abuse cases, I wasn't a veterinarian for a year before I got to witness uh, actually several different abuse qu- cases because this one particular individual had a big problem <laughs> and he had a lot okay. of dogs that it was affecting. And it is really frustrating because, of course, we get into this profession often because we love animals. And so when we see these things that we're nervous about uh, an abuse case, uh, you know, there's definitely an emotional aspect to that. And what I found as a baby veterinarian was that there were some legal things that prevented us from doing a whole lot at the time because of where he was located and, and all that kind of stuff. So this comes up for veterinarians. What are some tips or things that you've heard that even general practice veterinarians having to deal with? How are they best able to help? Are there opportunities to refer things to you? Like, how do you help veterinarians in that that side of things? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the first thing I do is when I when I talk to veterinarians, when I go and speak at, at different conferences, workshops and things, if you're practicing good medicine where you're actually writing good medical notes, you're actually one step ahead because it's, in these cases, a lot of it's all about documentation. So if your report just has like the letters NSS for nonspecific findings or WNL for within normal limits, that's not helpful, but that's not helpful for general medicine. That's not helpful for forensic medicine. That's not helpful for anyone because people go back to report and they're like, I have nothing to interpret here other than some letters. So I really don't know what you saw, right? So if you do good report writing, you're actually one step ahead of the curve. Because we can go back in time, we could look at the paperwork, the imaging you took, whatever it was, and, and start to create opinions on your case. So like, that's one part. The other part is to know your state statute, right? If you're a mandatory reporter, know what your requirements are. A lot of them are, are simply suspect abuse. It doesn't say prove abuse. It doesn't say prove who did it. It doesn't say any of that. It's typically suspect abuse. And practicing good medicine, you know, when you have your differential list of here's my 20 top differentials and I've crossed out 16 or 17 of them and you're left with traumatic origin for fracture because I, animal abuse is not a diagnosis. So it's not a medical diagnosis. So I never diagnose animal abuse, but I diagnose the fractures. So if we rule out pathologic fractures, if we rule out motor vehicle trauma, we we remove all of these things you're kind of stuck with, it could be this or could be that. And then that might be a case where you're like, okay, I suspect this could be animal abuse or cruelty or whatever your statute is talking about. And then that's what you report. If you have 20 differentials and you've done the diagnostic tests, I think it's going to be pretty hard for you to say, 
I suspect abuse. Actually, it's just one of your many differentials. But if you, you have cases like that, you know, there's no reason why you can't reach out to others to ask for a second opinion or even a third opinion. You know, you go to the other people in your practice and they're like, mm, I don't know, maybe that's abuse. Maybe it's not, not really sure. But there are people out there who, who can give you that sort of support or give you other questions or tests that you might want to think about running before you go down that way to help rule out a couple of other things. Yeah. So I think for me, that's the, the biggest two things is practice good medicine, good note taking, and definitely reach out and know your statutes. Very good points. So, all right. What is your day to day like? <laughs> I, uh, is it pretty variable? Do you spend some time classroom? Do you have to go out and go to, you know, crime scenes or well, what, is, what, what is your day to day? Uh, well, I, always, I try to plan my day and, and I've, I've come to the point where there's no point because it constantly changes. So like today I started out with writing report and then I was in the middle of writing a report. It was eight fifty one in the morning. I was like, oh, I have to do our podcast in nine minutes. So like that, that's how my day started because I was writing reports all from my last week's work. I'll be doing an autopsy this afternoon. I was doing a workshop in South Carolina last week. And so I did 16 hours of driving to and from. So like all different things going on. I have a subpoena for a case for trial for Thursday. And then next week I'll be out of the office because I'm going to be working on developing a training course for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And so that's four days of my week that are, are gone, just dedicated to building a training curriculum. So not to mention, you know, the phone calls on wildlife cases, and I have two other incoming cases today. So I'll squeeze them in along the way. So that's just kind of like my week in a nutshell. But that didn't cover any of the research projects that are going on. Luckily for, for this week, I don't have any teaching that I have to do. But I do teach on clinical rotations, that sort of thing. So it kind of changes day by day, week by week. I have a calendar and constantly changing meetings because I'm like, well, this autopsy is coming in. So I need to move that meeting somewhere else. And then I get a subpoena, you know, so it's. It, it's kind of crazy at any one time. I have about 30 subpoenas on my desk right now. And they're just constantly, constantly changing. So it, it's not your, your typical, you know, I have my appointments every 20 minutes. My weeks are so volatile. They're so up and down. And I, and I look forward to having a slow week so I can catch up. And this is an actual slow week for me. So it's, it, this is like report writing week and reading slides on my microscope week. I understand why you're hiring another pathologist. Yeah. And it, uh. For anybody who thinks a pathologist that just sits in a lab all day, uh, no. No, and I was like last night I was on the phone at nine o'clock at night talking about a case. I, I say it's pathologist hours. You know, I think pathologist pretty good hours, but I do most of my phone calls at night because I just don't have time during the day. Well, I mean, I, going through vet school, certainly did not have a forensic pathology class. So I think it's really a neat opportunity for students at the University of Florida and, and talked about, you know, you are looking for another veterinary pathologist because you're staying quite disappointed <laughs> and uh, people really seem to like this class. So do you mind sharing a little bit about what it is like for a veterinary student going through the class and some of the feedback that you're getting on what they're enjoying? Yeah, so I teach two different things to vet students. I have an elective class in veterinary French pathology, and then I have a clerkship. And so they're different. The clerkship is designed to do that hands-on, like this is how you would do different techniques. So we learn about photography, and we, we provide them with, with a nice camera on day one, and they use that camera for their two weeks on the rotation. And they just learn how to photo document throughout the whole process. They learn how to do like basic evidence collection. We'll start off with, here's how you seal up a bag and this is the information you need. We'll go over the forensic autopsy. We'll go over different aspects of a scene, like how would you search a scene? 
And all of that information that they learn in the first one week and four days on their last day of the rotation, so the last day of that second week, they actually processed an entire mock crime scene. So we set it up so that they have way more that they can process than they have time for. If we give them about four hours and they go through and they do all of the different skills that we've taught them and kind of give them the aha moment where they're like, oh, this is why they were showing us this on the first day. And some of the things they're, they're going to miss because, you know, we give them so much to do, but it's a really good class because it's going to teach them the appreciation of really what goes into an investigation. I'm not expecting them as a veterinarian to go out there and help. But when they are talking to investigators, I want them to understand what the investigator went through. So that's why we teach them to process a scene because then they may, you know, if they're a shelter veterinarian or, you know, even a private practitioner who is called on to help and they have that interest and drive, they might be asked to help and the student might say, sure, and not be deer in a headlight the time that they're out there because they'll have at least experienced it and had an understanding of of what goes on. So that's like the hands-on course. And then the didactic course, it's really just a crash course in the different major categories. So we do one whole lecture on starvation and kind of go through that. We do a course on toxicology and, and really to mitigate the CSI effect of there's a magic thing you can do for every sort of toxin and really have them think about how they would approach it. We do a thing on testifying in court, kind of what is expected of you, who are the different players in the courtroom and what are their role. So hey, in a nutshell, it's just a crash course to, again, open their eyes because in, we do our, our elective courses here in, in really short blocks of two weeks, and it's just like 15 hours, boom, and you're done. So really overwhelming. And so bird's eye view of each of those and kind of go into a little bit of detail here and there, like on points where you want to emphasize, like, this is really important and here's why, but the whole time telling them just like any other kind of medicine case is there are people out there willing to help you and consult with you. And so it's not uncommon that two years later, I get a phone call or an email or a text from a former student. It was like, hey, Dr. Stern, I have this case and I want to run this by. And I tell them at the end of the class that you can always ask for help. The, the worst thing that someone's going to tell you is, sorry, I don't have time right now. But then you can contact someone else. So they may even ha- say, hey, I'm not the best person. Contact this person. That's how I practice medicine too. If there's a case where I'm like, I could do that, but I'm not the best person for that. I will get you to the person who you should use. You know, I know my limits and I know my areas of expertise and I I don't like to stray outside of that. Get to the person you need for sure. Yeah. Well, and I think even though that's a lot in two weeks, sometimes when, you know, I was talking about us getting nervous around legal issues or not knowing what to do in some of these cases, some of that fear is just because we have never been exposed to any of it. And so we're often afraid of what we don't understand. And so even if you have a two-week exposure of understanding everybody's role in a a case, like even on the legal perspective, and and this is what they're going to have to do and go through, that I think that helps that empathy aspect of, oh, okay, I know what their job is. I know what they're trying to do. They're not just trying to abuse me in the process. (laughs) Like, this is just what they're doing. This is, well, you know, what's going through their mind. And I think that's a huge help. And then you also mentioned NCIS kind of things. You know, we do have these on TV, animal cops and stuff like that. And so I I think some people probably have in their mind of that kind of thing. What do you think they might miss watching it on TV versus real life? Well, I think the the one thing is the, the time it takes on TV. You could sit there on your couch and you're going to be screaming at the TV, test the this or test the that and do this and do that. And, you know, in your 45 minutes of your TV show with your commercials, it all gets done. And, you know, they on TV, they're picking they're picking perfect cases. There are a lot of cases that are not perfect. 
we don't have all of the evidence because it's been not collected properly or whatever else is going on. So, I mean, that's the first thing is on TV, they have all the evidence and it just happens to be, they find the trophy with the red fluid on it. And you're like, no, that's not what's going on. You know, it's not always in front of you. So that, that's one thing, it's the evidence, the time it takes. Nowadays with animal cases, they're the voiceless victim. They're, they're like little children who can't tell you what happened. So you, you have that added factor of, okay, now our only witnesses might be animals. There was, there was no one else there. It's just the, the victim animal. And so we have so much more to ask questions about. And ultimately it's, it's science, but it also, the thing we don't realize on TV too, is the finances that go into it, right? Someone has to foot the bill, right? And that's honestly a big factor that I deal with is people always ask how much, right? And I, and I just want to tell them, yeah, it's free. In reality, someone has to pay for it, right? At the end of the day. And this is not the, the place to discuss and argue who's supposed to pay for it. But, but that's a illegitimate question that I think us as a profession, society in general, government need to figure that out because the answer is not simply free. There's a lot of tests that do cost a lot of money, like a toxicology test, for example. So I deal with a lot of poisoning cases. And for me to truly work up a poisoning case the right way, several thousand dollars. And you have agencies who are investigating these cases that don't have a dollar set aside for investigation. And so they look for the cheapest and free option. And that's not always the answer because to do it the right way, for me, it costs money. And I love to say it's free for everybody, buddy. In reality, it, it can't be. Nothing is free. Nothing, nothing is free. And even where you say it's free, the money came from somewhere. It just didn't, if I could plant the tree with a dollar bill and grow hundred, that's free. It cost me a dollar. But in reality, it, it, not that way. And I think that's just a, a bigger conversation. I have some answers in my brain on, on how to do that, but large scale is a big problem. I think that tends to come up in vet med. I mean, it's not something we think about going into vet schools. And again, I think that's just part of life is nothing is free. And so it's no matter which career path you go into, there's probably an element of it somewhere. And it can be really frustrating. So, you know, one of the questions that I, I wanted to ask you is, I mean, I'm sure the financial burden on top of everything can be really frustrating, but I mean, you're dealing with some hard cases. And mm -hmm. so again, for people who do care about animals and you're in this, how do you deal with some maybe emotionally hard cases? How does that kind of, how do you get through the day? Well, if for, for me, I mean, there's, there's no magic way to, to do it, right? No matter way, everybody handles things differently. I mean, in some ways for me, my ultimate goal is advocating for the animal, right? Whether that person did it or that person did it. If somebody did it, I'm going to tell you, this is a human induced injury. Okay. And I'm going to advocate for that animal. Tell what happened to the animal. Try to get you as much evidence as possible. Right. And so that's my drive saying, this is what happened, but I'm also going to say that was a natural disease. No one did that. That's part of life. And that's kind of my drive. That's my end goal is to do that advocating. How I compartmentalize it, I don't really know. You know, some of it is, it's my job, right? I have chosen this career path that I know I'm going to see some of the most horrible stuff that most people do not want to see. Most people should not be. And I think my brain has figured out a way to just compartmentalize it. I talk with colleagues about cases and that's kind of an outlet for, you know, not going to go home and, and, and talk to my kids about 
all the heinous stuff I've seen. My kids know what I do, you know, so like they have a good understanding about what I do. And, and they're like, oh, you go on a court today because you're dressed up with a tie on. So, but they know what I do. You know, my wife knows what I do, but they don't need to see that. So in, in some ways, it, it kind of maybe like how I've been pre-programmed, but it's not for everybody. You know, I do things outside of work. I don't know how I find time to do all the things outside of work, but, you know, I do those things. And I think those are outlets as well. And then I think the other part is the, the drive to see the profession change, right? And expand it, improve how we deal with these cases. So I think for me, it's more the end goal. I see the end goal. I see what I'm trying to reach. And I have lots of really, really lofty ideas that I'm trying to do. And I know I'll do them, but the same way for human pathologists. So MD pathologists, right? There are some forensic pathologists who they just can't do the itty bitty children cases, the neonatal cases. That's just like super hard for them. And so everybody's got their different limitations. I couldn't examine things with a heartbeat. Like that's just not in me, you know? So everybody has like, they know these are things I just can't, I can't do for whatever reason, but it's hard to like, just say, you know, this is how you do it. So I get the question all the time and I don't have a perfect answer. And it, each individual really has to figure their way out, but it's not for everyone. I'll be the first to admit that when I talk to people and they're investigating a certain type of case and there's, there's video evidence of that case, I'm like, you have to watch it. You have to watch that video. You have to see what happened to that animal so that you can correlate your finding. Is there medical evidence that would support that event? Clearly it's on video, but some cases you know, might have very minimal and you don't even know the significance of it until you see the video and you're like, that makes sense. That action caused that lesion, that pathology. Whether the animal is alive or deceased, different veterinarians might be looking at it, but you have to watch that stuff. And that will probably bring nightmares to some people, not going to lie. So it's definitely one of those areas of, of practice, just like our MD counterparts that they have the same problem. And you talked about being the voice of the animal. And, and I think that can get you through a lot. But then knowing yourself and knowing your limits and, you know, partnering with other people who can you overlap yeah. limits, I think is really healthy and allows you to do some great things and still be able to go home at the end of the day. And I think you're right. I think some people, they can find that and the, the, the reward in it. And some people just can't. And my father is a child psychiatrist and he has done expert witness. He's done everything. And there have been some times where I've asked him, like, how do you come home at the end of the day? You've, you've been the best father ever. You know, you were always present for us. Right. And, and how do you do it? And he's one that just tends to be able to, he crosses the threshold and he can kind of turn it off a little bit. I'm, I'm just not. <laughs> yeah. So I think we all, you know, need to find our, our strengths and not be afraid to also know when, okay, that's not something that I can do. And, and that's nothing wrong with that. It, it's actually better to know that so you can stick with your strengths and, and be able to, to live those. Yeah. You have to know where your line is. Like you have to leave work at work. Yes. I bring work home with me because I'm on the phone and things like that. But I, I do leave work at work. I might wake up in the middle of the night and have that aha moment. I'm like, oh, that, that's probably what it is. But you try to leave it at work as much as possible. Sometimes easier said than done, but it's something definitely worth working on for sure. And you work with students, you talk to a lot of different veterinarians. Is there something that you would like to leave as maybe something you've learned personally or, or just words of wisdom that you would like to share with the veterinary community? Especially for the veterinary student, like the, the younger veterinarian who has so much of their career left is don't just close your doors because you think you want to do one thing, especially as a student. It's like experience it all and you'll start to hone in on 
on different areas. Like, you know, you might say, I want to do a residency and you do your residency and you realize, but I really want to do something else. That's okay. You can go do that something else. You're not locked in. And some of the specialties maybe don't even exist yet. We're experienced this whole digital age of, of pathology, artificial intelligence. There's going to be things that, that come out of it for sure. Y you know, even as a radiologist, the vertopsies and all these minimally invasive surgeries that we're just starting to do in veterinary medicine compared to our MD counterparts who have been using robotics for a long time now to do surgery. So I think there's so much more coming that uh, I almost say, look at the human side and, and see what they're doing. And there might be some fruitfulness for you on the veterinary side. So just keep an open mind. I mean, if, if I didn't keep an open mind, I, I, I would be sitting here today. I would be doing something else and probably miserable. <laughs> So you mentioned the, the human side of things. So what is your favorite conference that you go to? Do you go to like a, maybe even a human pathology conference? What conference do you go to? Oh, I, you know, I, I don't usually go to just one. So I kind of like try to, to, to do different conferences. I mean, I, I think it just depends what I'm, I'm looking at at the time. I think one of the, one of the fun ones has nothing to do with veterinary medicine. There's some of the animal control conferences that I go and speak at because it's it's just a different audience that they really want to learn. And they the problem with animal control and animal services a lot of times is they are underfunded. And so being able to show them, like, look at all the things that you can do, just super cool. So I think there's lots of good scientific conferences out there. I go I typically go to ACVP every year. Um, it's always a good time. You always learn about new up, up and coming things that are out there. But I do try to go to different ones, just even if I go one time, just to be like, oh, something different, a good experience. Well, I think that's good. You get a very wide perspective. And I'm always an advocate of that, of, you know, back to your tip. That's a very vet life reimagined <laughs> tip. It's like what I'm trying to. <laughs> to talk about is stay curious, stay open, try different things. And you're right, you're not locked in. You can uh, explore um, and, and learn new things. And I, I think just the idea of there are going to be jobs in next year that don't exist this year. That's oh, yeah. oh, yeah. very exciting. And, and just going to different things to just kind of see what's out there. AI and, and pathology, you know, all these kinds of things are potentially really exciting and coming and, and really expanding even more in our already pretty diverse profession. So I think that's fantastic. So as we only have a few minutes left, I, I usually end with a final few questions for you. All right. uh, the first one is, do you have anything on your bucket list that you would like to do? Oh my God, my bucket list? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a lot of things on my bucket list. I guess one of them is I cruise a lot. I do want to do, I don't think I want to do a cruise around the world or anything like that, but I, I do want to do cruises around the world. So hit up some of the, the places I, I haven't been. It would be super cool to do some sort of Antarctica thing just to be like, yeah, okay, I hit all the continents now. That's on my bucket list. I like to travel, but I, I like to do it cruising style versus just go to one destination. I like the, the moving around bit. Yeah. Yeah, well, that fits your your nature. <laughs> Do you have a skill or an interest that maybe not a lot of people know about? I have a green thumb. I do try to grow things. Florida is really harsh. It takes time and practice. But my most recent save was, you know, desert style plants that my kids just forgot to water. And I learned how to propagate these plants from really from the dead leaves and things. And so brought the whole thing back to life, which has been pretty cool. It took a long time, probably about three years to like actually see it come to fruition. But, you know, going down from brown rot and, and now it's actually nice and green, uh, it has been rewarding. I grow, help try to grow milkweed for our monarch butterflies that we have 
yeah, little things like that. That is really cool. I butterfly gardens and things I, I just love, but I do not have a green thumb. I feel like I'm I'm so nervous. I don't even want to touch a plant sometimes because I'm like, you probably won't survive. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, what is something you're very grateful for? A lot of things, but I think the the support that I get from my wife and my kids and friends and all that. I, I lead a busy life and just knowing that the support is all there is, is really good. You know, sometimes just a little bit of good job like that. That's all you need. I hope you enjoyed this fascinating veterinary story. We can make an impact in so many places. Check out the show notes for lots of resources. Please make sure you are subscribed on your podcast app, subscribe on the YouTube channel, and follow me on LinkedIn where I hang out the most. You can contact me on LinkedIn on the website at vetlifereimagined.com. And brand new is that you can text me. To send me a text message, find the link at the top of the show notes below that says, send us a text message. I want to thank our longtime sponsors, Fire Consulting and Will Hughes, who support the podcast over on our hosting platform, Buzzsprout. You can support the podcast too. Just check out the show notes for a link. And I hope to see you next time on Vet Life Reimagined.